Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Natalie. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Natalie. Hi. Um, thanks for being here with me at this men's meeting, the one other woman in the room. <laughs> um, I'm, uh, incredible. I know. Yeah. It's okay. We're the strongest I'm in here. You. Yeah. You got this girl. Calm down, Troy. <laughs> um, so, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous has done, I don't have a, I guess there's a time right there. That's fantastic. Um, Alcoholics Anonymous has done some incredible things for me. Um, I already said my name is Natalie. Do you guys know my name is Natalie? That's fantastic. <laughs> um, you know, I I am not just sober because I, I remember, I'm sure a lot of us have been sober and not happy. You know, I, I tried being sober a lot uh, without something in place. Like, to be constantly uncomfortable sober is the most miserable thing in the world. And it's and it's really, really lonesome. Um, and Alcoholics Anonymous brought me friends that even when I was miserable, y'all stuck around me. I, um, I, 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 I do things now, you know, like helping people out and not just in Alcoholics Anonymous. And don't expect, like, a praise for it. You know, I don't have to shout out about it. I don't have to post it on Facebook every 15 minutes. You know what I mean? And it's, it's, um, even better that people ask me for help, you know, not just in Alcoholics Anonymous people everywhere, like ask me to help them to do something. Um, my, my, this is incredible. My boyfriend's mom gave me her debit card and her pen number the other day, (laughs) you know, and, uh, well, she doesn't know much about me, so. (laughs) <laughs> That's probably why. <laughs> um, I don't. I don't ever where I don't ever know where to start. So I have a pretty long career um, trying to get sober. I have a longer career not knowing that sobriety was a thing that was possible. And um, my first AA meeting, I was fifteen. Um, I entered that AA meeting on meth, so everyone was looking at me. Maybe not truly, but, you know, shadow people everywhere. Um, it was really strange. I had a 25-year-old friend, and I was 15, and uh, I just I hung out with people like me all the time, you know? And it was people that uh, made me feel normal. So I get more of the normal feeling, not just from alcohol. Alcohol brought me that normal feeling. Alcohol brought me the feeling that uh, everything in the ninth step promise is promised to me. It just didn't last that long, you know. Um, But I did other things, too, that would help me feel that way. I'd hang around certain people that would help me feel that way, that that would essentially co-sign everything, you know. Um, I... if first and only time I got arrested. I was also 15. Uh, I blew a point like two, three, four or something like that. And I didn't, I didn't know what that meant. I just know the cop was very excited about it. And I I had, (laughs) I had cigarettes in each one of like lit cigarettes in each one of my fingers and just walking up to the cop, like, you want to, (laughs) I'm 15. I'm like a hundred pounds and blonde. And he's like, yeah. Um, Anyway, I got arrested then, and it was on Mother's Day, so that was good, too. Um, And I'd like to say that I was just super sneaky after that and never got caught, and I don't think that's what it was. I think it just, you know, missed Mark somehow. They missed me. Um, I I went uh, constantly back up a little bit. I did everything all the time. And I remember walking to a party and, um, everyone going, I must've been about 16 or 17 and everyone going, Natalie, like you're here. And they made me feel so welcome. And I said in my head, and this is so weird. I said in my head, I 
made it. You know, and I'm chilling with these people. I'm like 16. I'm chilling with these obviously unhealthy 20 something year olds that would allow a 16 year old to be at a party, you know, um, with, you know, drinking and drugs and, and all of that. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, I try to recollect I'm, I'm having trouble right now. I'll be honest. I try to recollect all these drinking and using stories. And when I get up here, if I'm sitting and talking to somebody who's still drunk and is a new person and doing like a 12 step call, it's no problem at coming out. You know, it's no problem. I think it's needed then. And then I come up here and I try to talk about it. And the only thing that I want to talk about is sobriety, you know, cause I'm not going to lie. There were parts of sobriety that were so much harder the where drinking would have been easier, you know, or at least in that moment would have been a lot easier. I tried to get sober. Um, the first time that I actually successfully, well, relatively speaking, so successfully got sober. I was, uh, 19. By that point I had been drinking and using for about 10 years, nonstop, not a day went by. And, um, and, uh, I was, I showed up to the detox center. I was 86 pounds. Um, my ears were bleeding. My eyes were bleeding. Like it was a mess. You know, it doesn't make sense. I'm like five, six, you know? And, um, and, uh, I, it went into, by then I had been to like, I don't know, 10, 15 rehabs. And so my insurance was like, look, if you're going to go again, you should probably go to like three in a row. And so I did. <laughs> and it was, I was an inpatient for like 150 something days, um, strung through three rehabs. Um, cause the other rehabs wouldn't keep me longer than like six weeks or this or that or whatever. Um, and I got out and I, I picked up the big book and I got a big book sponsor and I like ran with it. Right. And from the bottom that I mildly just described, like that seems pretty bad, right? That seems like a pretty, you know, badly mangled bottom where you're bleeding in places you don't know could bleed, you know? Um, and, um, I, I, people question me, like, how did you, why didn't you stay sober after that? People that don't understand that aren't us. Well, how could you not stay sober after that? Isn't that sufficient, you know, to keep us sober is knowing what that looks like. And one of the best things in the big book, it talks about how I can't recollect, right. With sufficient force, the suffering of yesterday. You know what I mean? Like I can't with sufficient force. I can maybe at one o'clock or two o'clock or four o'clock, but then by five, by five, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter anymore. Right. I've, I've then it's not sufficient enough. I know everything that's going to happen. And by that point, the insanity had been, the insanity had been not doing something over and over again, thinking that I'm going to get a different result. It was doing it over and over again, knowing what was going to happen. I knew what was going to happen. And when I, uh, I went back out after that and, and I, and I worked the program and I sponsored people and I called my sponsor all the time and I was going to meetings and I was doing service work and what was left out and it was God, right? I did steps one and I did steps 12 and I didn't do 11. And if, uh, and, and at least in my experience, when I'm not doing 11, I'm not really doing the rest of them. You know, all the rest of them are tied right into 11. And, uh, I went back out and I can't tell you why, right? I can say that it was this. I can say that it was a miscarriage. I can say it was whatever, but I mean, I, I, I drank because I was happy and I drank because I was sad and I drank because the sun was up and I drank because it was Tuesday and I drank because it was July 4th and whatever reason. And, and the fact is, is I drink because of consciousness and I don't want consciousness I hate being conscious because I hate this. I hate everything going on in there. Um, so I went back out again and then, um, I <coughs> kind of got sober again. Same thing went all in it. I was, I, I know every word in this book, every page that it's on. I know the words in Shakespeare and I know this and that, but it wasn't sufficient to keep me sober. I met a guy, um, I went, <laughs> I went and a couple of you guys already know the story, but <laughs> I went into a, um, a rehab to tell my story. I had about six months sober. I don't know. 
my, my falling off point was always between uh, seven and nine months sober. And I, and there was this guy sitting right about there where you're at and, uh, had a bandana around his hair, his head and his hair was all long. And I was like, what a douche. And, um, I, I, uh, (laughs) went to meetings and okay. I left and then I, you know, kept going to those meetings I was going to and douchey showed up. He was at those meetings after he got out of rehab and, um, kept asking me for my number so he could take him to meetings. And I knew that was ridiculous, right? I knew the 13th stepping and all that. And, um, Anyway, he kept calling me and kept calling me. I kept asking me to bring me meetings. And finally, I was like, okay, I'll bring you to a meeting, but that's it. Well, this wonderful man took me out to Taco Bell after. And I had literally never had a man other than my daddy buy me dinner before. And he bought me the 12 taco box. I know. So you guys get it. Thank you. Supreme. All of them supreme. And, um... Next thing you know, it was about six weeks later, we moved in together. You guys know how this, you guys know how this works, right? And it's funny saying it out loud, but it's truly devastating. Okay. I've got six months sober. I was the predator there. No, I was the predator there. And I have six months sober, seven months, something like that. And I am so uncomfortable though. I didn't realize it. Right. Because when we get sober, we get this awareness about us that we know where we're at, but we don't continue to do that 11th step. That awareness doesn't stay there. We're not aware of these character defects that are coming out. It just doesn't stay there. I become blind and again, delusional. I become then again, delusional and getting out of that. Once you're in it, that act of providence. And sometimes it, it just doesn't come, you know, sometimes we're way too far gone to get it back. And that's, that's where I was. Right. And everything was awesome. It was so good. Right. So good that the place that I worked so hard to move into the woman, the woman ended up, I mean, it was police cars. We were sober police cars and everything to get us out of that house sober. That's how well it went. Right. (laughs) I have this problem and I think I'm going to go ahead and speak for a lot of us. Okay. You're welcome. And, and I, I feel like I can say this because I've sponsored a lot of people. We all have this issue. Most of us have this issue that we think we're different from that situation over there. The situation that you've been in, that you've shared your experience with me doesn't go well. I think I'm going to do it differently. I think that about everything in life. I mean, I did that before I got drunk the very first time. My parents would say, Probably shouldn't walk over to the chicken wire fence. Probably you shouldn't put your hand on the electrical fence that's holding cows in. And I just, I just got to try it. You know, I know that people have been hurt really badly, you know, but I, I, I got to grab it anyway. You know what I mean? Cause I think that I'm going to be different. It's a, it's a bit insane, you know? Um, anyway. I thought that I would be different in that scenario. I thought that it's not about not having a relationship in the first year. Cause I don't, I don't agree with that. What I agree with is finding out who I truly am, killing everything inside of me and rebirthing it as it talks about, Ooh, that sounds weird. Rebirth. As it talks about in that third step promise, we were reborn, right? If I have not been reborn, I'm the same human that I was before. I want to kill that. Like nothing about my ideals, everything that it talks about in We Agnostics, smashing all those ideals. Nothing about that, at least in my experience, because I am that real of an alcoholic, nothing about that can be the same. I'm not the same person. You know, I came into AA before, and there's a few of you in here that, that knew me before then. And, and I went back out again then too, and I've come back and I'm, and, 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 Uh, most of y'all I'm really super close to, and y'all have told me that I look different. I walk different and I talk different (laughs) and behind closed doors. I'm different as well. Right? Like it's that total psychic change that it talks about. It's not, I, I don't take that lightly anymore. I don't take that just as simple as making sure that I pick up my dog's poop when I'm walking it out. It can't stop there. Right? That may be the beginning of it. 
where I'm being a bit more honest, but this honesty has to, has to creep through in ways that I've never known before. And I'm, I, I hope there's more, you know, that's what keeps me here is knowing that what I learned yesterday, that awakening that I got yesterday, there's going to be more, right? Anyway, we got kicked out, blah, 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 blah. I feel like I've told this a hundred times. <laughs> he, um, we still sober. I got pregnant on purpose. It's one of the hardest things I've ever had to say for a long time. I said it was a mistake, right? To cover up something. I'm so, and it was so embarrassing. I'm so unhealthy that I got pregnant. I was one of those chicks, man. I got pregnant on purpose and there was nothing good about the whole thing. And, um, anyway, I lost that child and, um, I remember in that moment, you know, the book says, it doesn't say what it was like. It says what we were like, what happened and what we are like now. Well, what I was like then was I played weak. I played like that affected me, that miscarriage, because I thought that's what, that's what we were supposed to feel. Right. When we had a miscarriage, the other girls, like they would feel so awful about it or, you know, just unhappy. And I, I didn't feel that. I was just like, all right, let's try again, you know? And there was, there was nothing there, but I, but I, I would cry. Right. I remember sitting on the hospital bed and it was really painful, but not in here. There was no connection to anything. Right. And, um, I remember sitting on the hospital bed, like forcing myself to cry. That's what I was like. That's borderline sociopathic. If not, you know, I did that with so many things in my life, man. I, was happy or acted happy when I thought that's when I needed to be. I laughed when I didn't really think things were funny. I was angry at things that I thought people should be angry at. Um, you know, anyway, it was not soon after that. I said for a long time that I drank again because of that miscarriage. And that's just not true. I drank again because I wanted to, I drank again because I wanted the effect produced right? I don't, I don't, I don't drink because it's raining. I don't drink because I had a miscarriage. I don't drink because somebody died. I drink because the effect of so is so elusive and I love it. I love it. And, um, I also started using again, decided to continue to get pregnant while that was happening. And I can't say that I consciously thought in my head that if I had a baby, things would be okay. And perhaps it would keep me sober. Cause I know that a lot of people say that, um, I can't say that that's exactly what was happening, but I do know that I was looking for anything possible to make me comfortable. And when I would see women with children and then the husbands and the family or whatever, I would look at that and God, they looked so much more comfortable than me. So perhaps I should try to do that. Well, needless to say, (laughs) didn't turn out that way. Um, by the end of it, I mean, throughout most of the pregnancy, I was, I was locked in my apartment kind of, I could have always picked up the phone and dialed 911. You know, I don't want to play the victim here. Um, but, but that's where it brought both of us to, let me just say that. Um, and I couldn't get off anything that I was doing because if I did, I'd risk losing the baby, which I don't even know if that's the truth. Um, I do know that I went to labor a few times in my apartment and was kept in there and fed things to keep the child inside of me. Um, I'm trying to not get too descriptive, uh, because I don't, I don't, this person is doing a lot better these days. Right. And we both are, you know, and, and I'll get to that anyway. It wasn't great. Um, by the, by the end of it, to wrap that little thing up, we moved back to, my daughter was in the NICU for about a month, month and a half, something like that. We moved back to Georgia, moved in with my mom. Um, and within like a week or something, uh, he was gone on meth came after me and my like one, two month old, who still had a heart monitor on with a gun. And, um, thankfully nothing happened. Uh, but he was seeing shadow people that night too. Um, and he left. So he left when she was maybe one or two months old. My daughter, her name is Merida. A couple of you met her. <laughs> um, a couple of you helped me raise her. Um, anyway, I got sober soon after that. 
what happens, the same thing, right? I take the book and I run with it and I read the words. That's all I do is I read the words and I sound phenomenal. You know what I mean? But again, behind closed doors or when I'm not in a meeting, nothing was being brought into it. And you wonder why, you know, this power greater than myself, it's not just there for alcohol, okay? Because there's certain things that I am, certain actions or certain behaviors that I possess, like attention seeking, <laughs> that I can't keep together without a power greater than. You know what I mean? For, for it has to be, it definitely has to be a power greater than alcohol, but it has to be a power greater than me, you know? Um, and I just didn't do that step 11. Sponsoring, I don't know, 30 something people at a time, um, which there's nothing wrong with that. But when you're doing it without God, boy, <laughs> that is a um, crap show. <laughs> I'm trying to. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. <laughs> anyway, um, eventually what happened. So I, 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 I would like to make sure that I speak on pain a little bit. And I mean, true physical pain because I have true physical pain radiating throughout my body. Often. Um, some of you have lived the down on the concrete under the bridge type of life that I have, you know? And so some of you have probably had some and, and lots of liver issues. So maybe some of you know the pain that I'm talking about that is consistent and radiating and, and, um, my experience now with it is totally different than it was a couple years ago. But at that point, my pain had gotten so bad. Uh, and I did not have a power greater than myself, which means I had a power greater than nothing else either. Um, cause I think I'm powerful. Um, uh, anyway, it, it got really, really bad. And, and, uh, I wasn't just, I just wasn't willing to fight anymore. So I took what the doctors gave me and they didn't mean any harm. They didn't know any better. I abuse Tylenol for Christ's sake. <laughs> give me something that has any sort of effect at all. And I will abuse it. Give me 47 melatonin to make sure that I stay asleep through the night. You know, <laughs> you're laughing because you have the same issue. <laughs> anyway, um, I took a medication, uh, what was it called? Lyrica. Um, and within a week, I hadn't necessarily started abusing it yet, but within a week, um, without taking it, I was in full blown withdrawal. I wasn't drinking, wasn't doing anything else. Um, uh, but I was doing that and the allergy is really real in me. And when they talk about allergy, it, they, they, they don't speak just on to make that sound cool. I have an allergy. I break out in handcuffs. No, dude, I break out in serious allergic reaction. that includes my liver and my pancreas. Things get processed differently in me. That's what makes me a real alcoholic, you know, um, it happened. I mean, it, it was done. It was over with that. That was it. Now I, I, I put on a great show for a while. Um, but eventually I just went straight to, uh, taking pills thinking that I could take hydrocodone. I thought that I could take hydrocodone as long as I wasn't drinking and as long as no needles were involved. <laughs> hey, it was a problem, <laughs> you know, it's not, you know. Wild turkey. Um, <laughs> so uh, anyway, that just that just went really downhill. And, and, and there was this thing in my head that just kept going, which doesn't make any sense. We are psychotic, dude. It was like, I'm not drinking. And so, and I'm an alcoholic. And I knew I was also a drug addict, but I'm like, but look, it, it, it's not it. Like, it's not the thing. And then I would like more. You know, and so if I would like more, then it must not be doing the effect that, that, that it should, right? Like, I, I must not have much of an issue with it. I just, I, I tried to put it on a good show as long as I could. I don't think, like, you guys bought it. <laughs> I don't think y'all bought it. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was, it was sick. Anyway, I mean, that doesn't matter. The point is, is that I went full force again. Um, and it, and it lasted about a good eight days. Now, within that eight days, um, I had no tolerance built up with alcohol at all. And I still finished a very large amount. Um, I, I think I drank more 151 in that eight days than I ever have in my entire life, entire life. Um, 
Not to mention I was awake those entire eight days. Drugs are good for that too. Um, and by the end of it, I went to the hospital. My, my hands were gray. This hand was very close to, I mean, it was gray and, and it had cracked all once again, but the, the bottom line is that it was a whole other crazy bottom, right? And I had a bottom that was just as horrible as that a couple years ago, you know? Why doesn't that work? It's all those questions in the book that people ask us, you know? You'd think that that was bad enough she would stop. But it's not like I didn't want to. I think that's what, what at some point we all kind of feel. It's like it's not that I don't want to. I want to stop. There were a lot of things that I really wanted to stop doing, but I didn't have the power of sneaking out. I would tell myself every night when I got home from school to my mom's house, I'm not going to sneak out this time. Not going to do it tonight. I was not a sufficient power to keep myself inside. I, in sobriety, the, 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 the old sobriety, the one that I'm describing now that I relapsed before, I was not a power sufficient enough to not play every single dude that I saw. It was, it was bad. You know, I heard a lot of guys. I really did. And with the amends this time was freaking probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, anyway, I, I got sober again. I don't ever really have much of an issue getting sober. It's just the staying sober, you know, I can dry up periods of time, um, and it not be too bad. It's, it's, it's the living with myself after that, you know, not necessarily the things I've done. Cause I still don't really care about you or me. It's just living with everything that's going on up here. You know, um, I went into, I, I went into a treatment, um, and, uh, my daughter for the first time, she wasn't with me. That was insane. Um, I was a fairly good mother. Most of, most of the time over the age of 19, have I been sober? It's just been in and out and in and out. Right. So I never really even got, I don't think I've ever actually purchased alcohol. I don't think I've ever had an ideal enough to actually purchase alcohol any other time. I don't know. It was just, anyway, um, <laughs> weird to think about. Um, and my daughter went, my, my mom watched my daughter. Right. And what I, what I was thinking in the beginning of this, when I first got, so this, this was about two and a half, two and a half or so years ago. So I'm two and a half years sober. Longest time I've ever, ever, ever been sober in my life since like what, maybe, I don't know, nine. I don't know. I really don't know the truth to that. Um, but I, I, uh, I got uh, a sponsor. Some of you guys know him, Doug. He's bald. Really annoying. Um, <laughs> probably the best. <laughs> probably the best person that could have ever been put in my life. Because this time, when I started knowing the big book better than him, he would say, shut up. Do you want to do this or not? invite God into it or don't, don't waste my time, you know, and thank God for that. We sat there and, and, and read every single line and, um, brought God into it every single time. I remember there were times where he would come up to the rehab I was at, right. Which was like a, an hour drive for him to do. And he would do this often. Um, and we would sit there and read every single line. Right. And, and there were times in the middle of us, sitting there and reading. And he'd be like, wait a minute. I see you over there. You're over there right now. Let's bring it back in. And he'd stop us and make us pray. It was so annoying. It was so annoying, but incorporated this thing into me understanding that, um, I don't deserve to be here right now. You know, the things that I've done, the places that I've been, um, there's no, it just doesn't make any sense for me to be standing in front of you guys. Like, for anybody to even trust what I have to say or to consider having me come up here. It just doesn't make any sense from where I was. And, and, and he saw that too. And it, there, there, there's one person in my life for once that didn't make me feel pretty, but also told me that that was okay. You know, I looked really bad for a very long time. 
and uh, my insides were being at that point ripped apart and put back together, they were dying, right? Again, that rebirth that it talks about, we were reborn. And in order to be reborn, something has to die. And he taught me that the whole insides of me had to die. And that mean every idea that I thought I knew, you know, that set aside prayer, you guys know that I had to say that over and over again, not, not necessarily had to for me, but I was made to, and it worked. And I don't know, you know, that step one, it wasn't exactly something that I had an issue with saying that I was an alcoholic or believing that I was an alcoholic because I knew exactly how it worked. My brain had been lit up on a CAT scan and showed that it was different than theirs than the mothers, the normies. God, they're so weird. Um, I watched a normie the other day. I'm telling you, it was so weird. It was July 4th, right? We went and visited my friend and uh, her husband's a normie. And he had a bottle of Corona. First of all, come on now. Second of all, he had a bottle of Corona and there was about that much left at the bottom. He poured the rest of it down the drain. Do you know how annoying that was? It just pissed me off. Um. Anyway, where was I at? <laughs> just getting mad here. Um, I, I, uh, a step one was never, never much of an issue for me, but what, what was an issue in step two, and I never realized this cause I never actually took a step two was believing, or at least realizing that I could come to believe that a power greater myself could restore me to sanity. And I didn't necessarily think I was insane. I just didn't know the depth of it. You know, and I applied that to alcohol, no problem. And that's why I feel like it was never an issue for me to get sober. The problem with staying sober is I didn't believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity and all the other aspects of my life that I was insane in, right? So men or food or other women or you guys, because y'all are nuts. Um, I mean, career. Anywhere else I felt insane, right? And there's so many things that once the alcohol is removed that I begin to obsess about. All those things that I listed and then some. I obsess about certain things. An obsession, a thought that overrides all the thoughts. And I find myself, I can find myself doing that and it's and it's not very free, is it? To have that going over and over in your head about this has to be done, that has to be done. And, and, and if this doesn't go this way, then God forbid, you know? Um, and I walked through these steps this time, having taken a sufficient second and third. And it's not just, I watched them work in alcohol and I, and I, and I realized what was happening. I was aware enough. I was given a gift of awareness enough to be able to see how they worked in that matter. Right. So when I got out of this place, I pretty much went through the steps when I was in treatment and then got out and just started bringing them into all my affairs. And that's, that's kind of what the big thing is, right? Is bringing the principles into our affairs. So once we walk out of here, what we're doing there is showing whether or not I'm actually working a program of Alcoholics Anonymous and, um, all these spiritual principles were, I was given opportunity to show them out in my life. Right. So for instance, when I would make an amends, I wouldn't cut and it was a financial amends. God, I hate this. And I wouldn't come with, uh, I remember going to like my mom, for instance, to whom I owe a large amount of cash to most of us do, right? <laughs> Everything. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, any other time I got sober, it's just, I'm so sorry, mommy, you know, and what can I do to make it better? Oh, honey, just stay sober and blah, blah, blah. Well, this time, I mean, I had burned it so much. I had burned it so much. There really wasn't much left. And I actually came with cash this time. I, and I, I remember that day, that first real amends that I made that I didn't bypass, I handed her $2,000 and I didn't expect her to, to give it back. I didn't expect her to be super happy and surprised. I expected her to give me an amount of how much I needed to start paying each month. That was kind of like a down payment, right? And when she did do just that, I was okay with it. There wasn't this thing in my head that was like, man, I really thought that she was just going to be like, oh, honey, thanks so much for trying, you know, because uh, that was me before. I thought that if I gave you this grand gesture, gesture, that you would think that I am just a God, you know, like I've done some radical things here, 
You know what I mean? And, and she didn't do that. And what was more surprising is that I was like, yes, ma'am, let me get on that. And I was excited to do it, you know, because I, I truly, I truly felt something this time that made me want to pay restitution for harms done as it talks about, you know, there's, I, I, I feel like there's such a huge part of into action that is on that ninth step for a reason. You know, whenever any other time I was sober, I would, I would make these ninth step amends and it's not necessarily that I would just, well, yeah, I would just stop. That was a lie. Sorry. Um, I, I, yeah, I would just stop. I would just stop making, I wouldn't do the hard ones. I would do the ones that I know that if I made them, I would look good, you know, and I have such this, or this is, I have such an idea about how I need to look. You know, I'm so good at that. Um, that there's that one line that says, uh, we put on this face, which we know we don't deserve. You know, we act or, or, or we try to put on this, we try to gain this reputation in which we know we do not deserve. And he did that often. I was really good at it. I mean, a lot of us are, you know, we're really great at, at, at sounding good, especially to people who aren't that close to us, like our mom that knows we're full of it, like all the time, you know? And, um, oh, oh, here was a really big thing. My four steps. So what I used to do with four steps, which I, I would take a bunch of things from other people's four steps and put it on mine. And then I would read that to my sponsor. And I thought it was great because they were a lot more interesting and less devastating and less embarrassing. They were just kind of like more like, like you're a BA, like a bad but <laughs> like, like I would put stuff on there that make me seem cool, essentially, or what I thought was cool. And this time, let me tell you, like this honesty thing is so interesting. I would say the most embarrassing things that I did. That's what had to go on my four step. The way that I would feel, I would talk about jealousy that I had. I would talk about how people made me feel because I, I, I had this thing for so long where, you know how people talk about how they try so hard to be strong, but they're really weak. And I, I did this thing where like, I played weak on purpose, but I was really <laughs> strong. Right. And that's just as dishonest, if not more. And so this, this four step actually made me feel, and I feel it's not, ne- it was necessary in my case, at least so weak and awful. You know, that line that says we were delighted after the four step. I, I don't know why they put that there. I don't know if anybody's ever experienced that but I was not, I felt great that I had done something correct for once. It was totally honest, but total honesty is so painful. And I've never been so uncomfortable in my life. You know, one of the main things that, that I, that I talk about with my sponsees is being, being uncomfortable, right? I do whatever I can always to be comfortable. Like I, God forbid I have a sleepless night, right? It's, it's, it's that 47 melatonins again, right? Because I can't sit there and just feel it. And what I discovered is that normal people can get wildly discomfort, uncomfortable as well. Normal people can have sleepless nights as well. Normal people experience anxiety as well. They also have little bits of depression and this and that, blah, blah, blah. They feel all that, but they don't do every single thing in their power to get away from it. And that's what I do. That's what I would do when I would get sober. I would do everything I could to get, get comfortable. And if that meant any of the things that I listed prior, you know, the food, the men, the whatever, you know, 15 AA meetings a day, which Jesus, that was awful. Um, anything that I could do to make myself feel comfortable or more powerful, you know, and this time I didn't do that when I would get uncomfortable, which was often, especially when you told me something about myself that wasn't quite the reputation that I wanted you to think of me. I would literally, I had to do this sometimes grip onto the chairs or the arms on the chair and sit there and go through it. Like I had to actually feel it, you know, like I evaded this stuff for so long. I evaded the way that I felt for so long. I evaded there's embarrassing things in going through that forever. And I, I don't know if it just built up or what it was. I don't know, but it was also the most freeing thing that I've ever experienced in my life.
Um, I learned so much about my six and seven, you know, the, uh, character defects. And I, and, and, and I, I, I've probably written, I mean, I, I know two and a half years isn't that long at all. It really isn't, but I've probably written in that two and a half years, my jerk of a sponsor has made me write more four steps than I can count on my hand for everything that would happen, right? We would do a little mini four step. And then do six and seven on it and then a nine on it and, um, everything else that came with it. Right. Which, and then turn made me be able to bring it over into 12. And I, now the thing about it is, is me not going through all those things and being okay with being uncomfortable made it. So I didn't actually have experience to show somebody else how to do it. Right. I have this idea that I know how, what you should do and how you should get through something, even though I've never done it. Right. And that's just like somebody talking to us that's not an alcoholic. Like, I'll roll my eyes. Or I might be polite, but you just don't know. You know? And I, and you can tell now. Like, I can tell now if somebody's trying to give me, like, advice on something they've never been through before. You can just kind of feel it. You know what I mean? And it's so annoying. And I can only imagine, God, I would have punched myself within five minutes of knowing myself a couple of years ago. <laughs> like, it, it, that that's all I did was try to give out orders to people that had no depth or weight. And that's what we need is depth and weight. You know, um, I, uh, I had, so, okay. I didn't my, my entire, okay. The entire time my daughter's been alive with the exception of the month or two months that her father was around, I did not have a relationship. Um, I did everything I could to put men in my bed and then tell them that their Uber was outside. Bye. You know what I mean? Um, that was comfortable. That gave me comfort. I don't know if it put me up on a high horse to make myself feel better. I don't know what, I, I'm not too interested in that. I'm interested in stopping is, is the point. Right. And, um, I, uh, did a lot of work on that. And that was probably the most painful thing that I've ever been through. Is that embarrassing, deep, dark stuff that is like, that shows how ugly I truly am. Because remember, we're rebuilding inside of ourselves. And I can't do that unless I'm totally honest, right? That deep, dark, ugly stuff. I did more work on my sex inventory, I think, not not just in that one time, but every single time that I think I, I, I did on anything and found so much, so many character defects, and, um, so when I was, I don't know, year and a half, year sober, was it? Maybe a year and a half. Um, I met this guy who was extremely younger than me. It, it was really weird. <laughs> and, um, we probably dated for about a month <laughs> and that was the first relationship I had ever been in. I think real relationship I'd ever been in, in my entire life. I'm 27. Um, at this time, I think I was 25, maybe 26. I don't know. Um, and I was in this sobriety and that was really embarrassing. There was a lot of ego about that, right? Because he broke up, broke it off with me and this, he was essentially a kid. And then I had to realize that, that I was just dating a kid and, um, was like torn up about it. You remember that? And, um, I, I point that out because it was, it was, it was, it, it was so uncomfortable. And I remember getting down on my knees. This is where that step two comes in, right? I feel like in a lot of cases, step two, the whole coming to believe and that becoming a past tense that I have came to believe. It doesn't just happen with everything all at once, right? Like I talked about, I talked about in the beginning, this come to believe I have to bring step three in before I have actually came to believe that he's going to return me to sanity in that one specific thing. And there were in this, it was about a month after that, that thing ended that there were times where, and of course, as we know, had absolutely nothing to do with the dude, right? How could a month thing turn into like, what is going on in my brain? Absolutely obsessed. Like with how I feel on the inside, I'm down on my knees next to my bed, crying, screaming, I surrender. And it was so dramatic. It was so dramatic quite embarrassing. You're all laughing. And I know why it's embarrassing, whatever. <laughs> but I went through something that was terribly uncomfortable. And not only did I not drink over it, because at that point that was, I don't want to say given, but I worked really hard for that. 
and what I had done that day and the day before really ensured immunity, right? It's like it talks about in 12 step, the things that I was doing, I continued to do the things, but what else it did, I, I remained uncomfortable and didn't run to other things that make me comfortable, right? I sat through that and I, and I got through it and I would have never learned what I know today in regards to that or be able to help somebody else if I had not done that. If I had jumped to something else to make me comfortable, you know? And so, um, anyway, further in that, I, uh, did actually meet somebody and I would like to say this is the first true boyfriend I've ever had in my life. And again, I'm 27. Um, and he's a non-alcoholic guys. It's super weird, but let me tell you, it's so much easier. <laughs> it is so easy. Poor thing. Oh, I feel so bad for him. He, um, the, the, the thing is, is it's not, it's not necessarily, a, we, we really do match up who we hang out with. Right. And if the person that I'm hanging out with, not just guy, but like my friends or whatever, if they're not also growing, why should I be, you know? And I'm not talking about acquaintances here. I'm talking about people that I see so often and then I choose to, to discuss things with life, things, moves, changes, whatever, you know? And it's so weird how non-alcoholics can do that whole change thing and like growth without, you know, completely destroying themselves on the inside or going through this, like, I just need to surrender and pray. He doesn't have to do that. It's really weird. He's just like, well, I guess this is new. And, um, anyway, I, uh, I can tell you not even to do with the actual man is that the inside of me, there's no obsession. I don't hold this person higher than God. I, I, I never will, you know, today I know who I am. I know what I am. I know exactly who I belong to. You know, and that's a big deal for me. That's a really big deal for me. And I know that who I belong to isn't me, you know, and I, and I'm able to rightly relate myself to this other human on an actual intimate level. And I'm not talking about sex intimacy. I'm talking about intimacy in conversations that I have with the true girlfriends that I have today, my true friends, you know, or guy friends, you guys, y'all weird. It's like, this is a men's meeting now. She left. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go too. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Natalie. Um, but I, and I can have a true intimate relationship with my sponsees. So when I'm taking them through their fourth or their fifth or their sixth or their seventh, or when they're through the first round of steps that we go through, and then a problem arises a man problem or a work problem or whatever it is, then I can rightly relate God through myself. I can rightly relate myself and show how God did that and what God did, right? And if something comes up that they're going through that I haven't been through, I don't try to play like I have the right answers because in whatever area that is, I've never experienced it. So I've never experienced, as far as I know, insanity in regards to it. So I haven't come to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity in that area, right? So I send them to one of y'all, you know, I send them to somebody else for that moment. And then I generally get to learn something from it. You know, um, I, uh, I have, I have this one sponsee who she, uh, just straight up didn't believe in God at all. Um, and she went out and, uh, destroyed the insides of her body through a massive car accident and, um, came back in and she said something really powerful that I'll never forget. And she said, I don't even really care if there's one or not. I don't care if there's a God. I just, I just want to, I don't, I don't be me anymore. You know, and that's my experience. So I've gone through these spiritual, these God things, these up and down God things where I come in and I have a power to myself that I understand 
Okay, that's what it was. Then around seven to nine, remember I tell you, seven to nine months, okay, I always get shaky then. Then around seven to nine months, something like that, I woke up and there there was no God. I was certain of it. I called my sponsor and I said, there is no God. Can I tell you about it? And he was like, yeah, let's, let's talk all about it, babe. There probably isn't. You're right. You know, the old Doug thing that he does. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, uh, and he had me do some work, which was massively eye opening. Didn't lead me to believe in God again. And I don't think anything anybody would have said would have made me believe in God again. Um, led me to a few people and I sat there and spoke with them. I cussed them out a few times and they just smiled and, Oh, you'll get it, honey. And patted me on the back. And that just pissed me off even more. And, um, but I can tell you what I, what, what the best piece of, of, of experience that I took from that or what people were telling me to do was there's that part. And I talk about it often because it just came up in my head the past month or so is that part of the end of the doctor's opinion is though he may come to scoff, he may remain to pray. And that's exactly what I did. Okay. I didn't believe in something. And I had this whole painted outline of what he looked like, what he wore. I swear to God, like, like the God then wore a yellow t-shirt, blue jeans, and had one of those sports jackets on. I'm not even playing. He looked like Jeff Foxworthy. I'm not even playing. And that died in me. I don't know why or what happened between the time I went to sleep when I was absolutely spiritually fit to when I woke up that morning that he just died. And I'm so grateful for it. But what I'm even more grateful for is that he gave me the power to continue to get down on my knees every night and say, don't know if you're there, really don't believe you're there, but I'm gonna do it anyway, because they keep telling me to keep going. And it wasn't this flashbang experience right? That I had, but I did have a spiritual awakening. It was incredibly slow and it was uncomfortable and it was gruesome. And I cried often and I couldn't figure out what was going on. And I felt like I shouldn't have been sponsoring people. And I, and I, I, I mean, it was probably the most miserable time in sobriety that I had, but it was the most eye opening time in sobriety that I had. I busted my butt for that. I really, truly did. I, I and I, I was given the gift to, to keep going. You know, I was still down on my knees, but I was very honest with everybody. And I didn't want to be sponsoring people and have people look at me and say, you don't believe in God and you're sponsoring people. You know what I mean? Because that's what I used to do. I used to say that you can't do that. And I woke up with it. My sponsor said, don't you dare stop helping those girls. He said, don't you dare. You're going to regret it. And so I didn't. I kept going. And next thing you know, I, I, I don't know when it happened, but I do know that I realized that I had this whole new conception of, of God that I realized I didn't understand. And boy, was it an awakening. And it took my six and seven, strangely enough, to a whole different level. I think because the principle uh, behind seven being humility, I think it's because it, it gave me this, this ounce of humility that I've never experienced before in my life. You know, um, not knowing now I, I, I realize I, I mean, I had been crushed before, before that seven to nine months, I had been absolutely crushed. Cause I realized I really don't know anything. And I was, you know, just pounded into the ground. And then I got this whole new crushing, something else inside of me died and made birth for made room for the birth of something actually worth keeping. You know, I take, um, I take that last part of the 12 step very seriously, practicing the spiritual principles in all my affairs. And think about it, you know, especially integrity. I think that without integrity, none of them work. How can I do the service without integrity? You know, how can I have hope without integrity? How can I have humility, humility without integrity? I mean, certain things like that. Um, I don't know. I'm so glad to have completely died on the inside. I was dead on the outside. Y'all saw me. I was dead. There was, there wasn't much left of me. And, uh, every time I would get better, I wouldn't kill the inside too. But I did this time with the help of a, a competent sponsor that went through literally every line and exactly how it was outlined, no different. And a lot of help from God, to which I don't even care if it exists or not. I just know that you guys the ones that truly do believe and truly do have a step to, to look a hell of a lot happier than the people that don't, you know, 
and I want to be around you guys. I want to be around you guys all the time, man. You guys have given me, uh, you guys have given my daughter a mom, you know, and you gave my mom a daughter and that's pretty incredible. And I'm, I'm, uh, I feel like I'm worth living. Like, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm worth being around you guys, you know, and I just, I really, uh, appreciate everybody being here today. So thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.